Searching for a hero, people need someone to look up to. I never found anyone to fulfill my need. A lonely place to be, but I learned to depend on me. I started living on the street in 1996. Yeah. That's when my family pushed me away and to tell me that I should leave the house and um, they will kick me out of the family because of my gender. And, and since my mother passed away, and I had no, she really had this to give me love, so I started to find love on the street and people that really makes me happy each and every day, not only for a moment, but each and every day. I've been on the street for 17 years. Oh. And where are you now? Um, at the moment, I'm living in a shelter in Woodstock. Um, the shelter is called St. Anne's for homeless mothers and children. <laughs> right here, right now, at this moment. Now we're on our way to Pumlani. It's a township just outside of Cape Town. In Pumlani um, lives about 325 families in an informal settlement. It's a fairly new township. I think it's just over 10 years old, the township. But many people was moved there because of, you know, unemployment, have nowhere to live. People lost their homes. And um, as you may know, during the apartheid times, our people were moved from one place to the other and all that. And the um, unemployment rate is very, very high in, in Cape Town still in South Africa. So people live in this informal settlement um, it's a wooden iron home that they live in. There's just one water tap for all these families. To help us, ne? That. Help us, ne? There's no, no toilets, no, except for the step, there's no running water. We've got about um, between 60 and 80 kids running around there. Some of them go to school, others don't because here with us we still pay school fees and you gotta pay for your own stationery and you gotta have school uniform and all that. Makes it a bit difficult. This is the cup. the cups for the juice. Catherine, maybe you must take this. The clothing. This is Catherine. Yeah, Catherine is one of the community leaders here. She oversees all, you know, all the activities down here. And we, we work together, yeah. Yeah, with the soup kitchen and the feeding, all, yeah. And Catherine is also gonna assist us with the, with the um, kindergarten once we have that going. Yeah, so it will be the people from the community that's gonna, that's gonna do the crash. Yeah, are we gonna take the stuff to, to Cynthia's house? Yeah, okay. Three times a week I'm here in Pumlani 
we do feeding there that normally starts around four o'clock and goes up till about seven in the evening you know so yeah my day is never i, I can't really predict my my day you got a nice smile eh? okay look there into the camera <laughs> and you you got a smile too smile 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 like that man <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when are you going to um, to the office again? Are you tomorrow? Yes, tomorrow, but tomorrow. Okay. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Yeah, I will make time to come and talk to you about that place. And, that place. You know, yeah. All right. Although we are a registered non-profit organization, um, registered with the Department of Social Development, we we don't get any funding from the government. You know, and, and everything that, that you see me doing, I'm doing just, like I said, by faith and, and um, donations that people give me, you know, or, or rather give into the organization. And because we are registered, you know, the, the government check our books every year. So, yeah, it's a, it's a legitimate um, organization. And we have, I have the certificates I will show you a little bit later. But, um, we have to raise our own funds. Whatever we do, we have to do on our own. This is the one. Yeah? You want me this one? No. No, you keep that one for you. You eat already on that one and you eat on that one. Now you want to give it to me. No. Hmm? It's nice, you must eat it. It's going to make you strong. Fruit make you strong. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy and God bless you and keep you. Happy birthday to you. Wow. <laughs> I'm in the city for just over 10 years now and I've seen so many organizations coming into the city, making big promises to the people and, and then nothing materializes. You know, and our people has had such a lot of disappointments already and they already feel like nobody really care for them, you know, um, so we don't need another empty promise. What we do here, yeah? we, we stay here, we sleep together as a group, so we are responsible for, our, for each and everyone's responsibilities around here, so we look after each other and when, you, when someone got a problem, we sit like in a group and give each other advice and talk the problem out like in a group. So there's like more or less trouble around where we are based. Yeah. Some people just make money out of the street kids. Some people, they come, they do things with us when they get the sponsors then they leave us on the street. Like some people use us to get money, sponsors and things like that. And then they go, you see, they spoil, promise things to us. Maybe they're going to take you out the street or buy clothes or something, buy food, and then they don't come back and things like that, you see. At the moment, my health is not doing that good, um, especially um, in the environment where I'm based because we're not living healthy, um, they don't give a proper food, um, we should get more decent medication. My name is Buze and I'm originally from up country, born in the Western Cape and the reason I'm more than 18 years on the streets now and the reason why I left the home is 
because of my family couldn't accept the fact that I'm gay, you know, I'm born that way and I've been trying to to live a, a, a better life, you know, and I converted myself, gave my life over to Jesus and asked him to help me, but it just lasts for a certain time, then I went back to what I feel inside and and I love my life the way I want to do it. So I decided, no, I must leave my family and, and live on the street because then I'm more independent. I don't want to be a um, problem for my family at home, you see. And I met up with my friends, like I met up with Kurt and other people. And as he said, we're sleeping together and we look after one another and just see that nothing went wrong. And that's it. My social worker came there and, and she came to call me and she would tell me, Diego, yo, your mother died two weeks ago by the people that they, they didn't want to tell you because I would, would go around to, 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 to your mother's family and to the, to the friends. They would take me to my, to, my, to my mother's graveyard and I was staying the whole time. Then I, was, and I, I came back to the street and I, and I went to James for 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 for. for for three months and for three weeks, after three months and the three weeks, and I came straight out and I said to myself, I'm not gonna live on the street anymore, because I now I want to be a better person. I, I don't want to go every day to check go in and out, in and out. And after that, I said to myself, it's not gonna help if I'm gonna run away every time. Then I'm gonna come nothing in life, so I must stay there if I want to become something in the world. And I'll go back there and I'll tell them, I want to stay there and I'm not going to run away again. When you first met Pastor John, were you very ill? I was very... I wasn't ill when I first met him, but as the years goes, I started to get very ill. And I didn't know who to go to because the other organisations just dropped and they never took care of the people who were sick. So I thought of coming to Pastor John because I know he's a very kind person. I'm gonna take three of this. This I'm taking for the soup kitchen, huh? Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. And he's a very good person. He looks out for the young children on the street. So I just come to him and told him, Pastor, I can't handle it living on the street because I don't want to die outside. Can you please help me in a shelter and to get hospital so I can get my treatment? A traditional healer of the road who can go to a name a tota. A traditional healer of the road who can go to a name. This is this is a troubled area. This is a terrible, terrible area. If you if you want to contract HIV, you come and have sexual relations here and you contract HIV. By tonight, you will have contracted the disease. I promise you. This is where, if you, if you really need to come to South Africa, this is where you need to work. Set up some shake and then work from here. I've been working through nice nights In the soft and in the soft and in the soft It's a traditional hero of the road It's a traditional hero I work for an organization called the AIDS Trust um, We are an organization, we started off as a project that uh, worked with parents, with adults uh, living with HIV and AIDS but our focus has changed because um, we are now working with children um, and uh, orphans um, that we work with now because we found that uh, the parents became so weak and so sick that um, they could not look after their children. So the AIDS Trust sh shifts focus every three years. Like 
we would do in three years, we would work with adults and we would then go to children, then we would go to job creation because we wanted to do the whole scope of, of, of things. So at the moment, we, our main focus is children living with HIV and AIDS. It's difficult for me to drop food, go to this house, go to that house, go to this. It will take me a lifetime. So I just drop it here and then I leave it to those people to, to distribute. So don't give the impression that I don't do work in the area. I bring food regularly, once a week. I bring it into this area. No, no, not OC alone. I'm, I'm sure OC is distributes, but we can only give that much and to so, so many people. So that's the difficulty I have. I cannot go from house to house to distribute food. Last year, you know for yourself, obviously. Was it last year, yes? That we all run here every week. Once yeah. we were all running here. Yeah. Yeah. Like fools, we were sitting here like fools. I'm just know. talking the truth now. Mm. Yeah. We were sitting here like fools. Every week we had to run here, sit here, leave the work like here at home. We're waiting for her. We're waiting for her. Now for who are we going to wait again? Yeah. No. But we found that when we were distributing wheat picks to the, to the very vulnerable, to the poor in the area, right? I did not know who's coming from, from where, right? Somebody would come up and ask me for wheat picks and I would give them a box. I usually give four, four boxes. That's week one, week two, week three, Week four, so for the whole month you have enough wheat picks, right? But then five people come from one house, and I only learned it later. So it was all on this one side. Somebody got nine boxes of wheat picks, and somebody yeah. else got none. So what did what, what could I do? Because I didn't know who's who. The vegetables that we were distributing, as Desmond. You were working with me, eh? Yeah, we were distributing for the people. Some of the people, they take the wheat bix, they go sell it for wine. They sell it for wine and I don't think it's right they're doing. But I was yapping this man every day, most of the time of my life, I'm yapping that guy. Sometimes I go to the town center, I go to the walkers, they tell me, hey, here's a lot of vegetables, take it home, give to the people. But no, I can't do it. But my, my, my legs can't carry me anymore because uh, I, I have to walk with a wagon up and down, up and down. Okay. And I can't do it anymore. So with the vegetable thing, we, we still have access to a lot of vegetables that we can get from the, the, the market. The difficulty I had with the vegetables, again, is we would give vegetables, there would be a long line, we would just give it, and give and give and give and give and give. And two people come back and say, listen, I didn't get any vegetables and it's a whole fight. I'm not into that. I want to drop it somewhere and go because I have other work to do. That was a difficult thing. The yogurt was the same. Yogurt, we didn't get that much because yogurt was a luxury and it is still a luxury item. The difficulty I had with the yogurt was yogurt was, I was specifically going to distribute yogurt to children, right? What now happens with the yogurt is everybody wants yogurt. You have 200 yogurts, you give 200, there's 800 people, and that's a, that has become a problem to me. To distribute food is not that easy. To get food is very easy, but to, to let go of that food is not that easy. So if I disappointed you once or twice, that's now a hold to my record to say I'm a bad person. I'm not. I had several problems. As Desmond, we, we knew of people selling the wheat picks that we were giving, right? We were giving you that the milk was, was exchanged for, for other items that was never meant to be. And that caused a problem to me. Every three months I would bring in about two million rands. But because I have a lot of other uh, activities, like now, you know, it takes me out of an office. It takes me in the, in the streets, in, in homes, talking to people. Uh, yesterday we had to take somebody to a hospital. So if I'm a fundraiser, 
raising funds only, I will raise millions of rings. Tula, 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 papa, tula, sana. Tula, mamu, zobu, ya, ekuseni. I found out when I was pregnant with my baby. At first I was struggling with it. And what, what was I your diagnosis? To, um, I was uh, HIV positive. Some, sometimes it's still very hard. How long have you known Michelle? Almost two years now. Two years. Okay. And do you have much support? Sometimes yes, but sometimes... Like last week, I couldn't help myself. My children was without food. You didn't have any food, and you have two children. Yes, the one is uh, going to high school now. The other one is two years now. And do you have a partner? No. And do you have parents who live nearby? I stay by my mother. But I'm gonna say she also she also has her problems and. Sometimes we try to help it, but sometimes it doesn't have, so... And does she have work? Yes, she works. And do you have other brothers and sisters? Yes, but they... All the same. In South Africa, HIV and AIDS is, 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 is still very much like... Um, a, a very private taboo matter that you don't taboo. yes you don't openly talk about it and that's driving this whole campaign that we have underground but then there's reasons for it i think it starts with with government you know uh, our president our present president mr mbeki uh, has made some very weird statements. He said, show me a person that died of HIV and AIDS. Now, that is the president of the country. The man taking over from him um, said, after having sexual intercourse with the HIV unprotected sex, with the HIV positive uh, lady, he said, I just went into the shower to wash it all off. Now, if the leaders of our country are dead buyers, what do you expect from the people of that country? Do you still take the medication? Yes. I sometimes I can't take it because I can't take the medicine without food. Like I, I was, I was supposed to be there last week, but I couldn't stand up because I couldn't walk. So you couldn't go to the doctor. Is it a clinic you go to? It's a to? clinic, yes. Yeah. And how often are you supposed to go? Um, every month. Yeah. They give me medicine. And you don't always get there? Mm -mm. Oh. And how do you feel health-wise, apart from not having enough food and drink? So it's like some, sometimes it's fine and sometimes it's... It's when I stress a lot and... Heart of Healing is an NGO 
Um, we specialize in venture philanthropy. Just like in business, you get venture capitalists who create uh, business opportunities for profit. We create social opportunities for social gain. And it's really based on the premise that uh, as long as the donors keep giving to the charities handouts, the charities will never get themselves to a position of being sustainable. And what we do is we look for sustainable solutions where we can go in and help charities on an indefinite basis. And that's pretty much what we do. The children's home, we have 130 children at the moment. Uh, the kids are from naught, so they can come in one day old from the hospitals or from being abandoned. Um, and they go all the way up to 19 years old, 18, 19 years old. There's the famous uh, hole in the wall in Johannesburg where they figured out the easiest way now is just to build a hole in the wall and the ladies can go and stick their baby through a hole in the wall and then go and then they, they ring the bell and, and then they go out and there's another baby and this happens on a constant basis. So there, there are a lot of plans, there are a lot of strategies but it still doesn't help at grassroots level. <laughs> Uh, you, you're all sleepy. Look at you. You all have a sleep. So these are babies. These are our caregivers. This is Gugu. Hi, Gugu. Hi. Good work, you do. This is Lanika. <laughs> She's new here today. We have a program of volunteers who come between six weeks and three months, actually, from all over Europe and America. They come and help in here, and they're usually on gap years or post university and that type of thing. So they come in here and help the caregivers with the babies and everything. Yay. Ani, Papamilian in many ways kind of shows you the, the growth of the disease because it's gone from a shack really in four years to being this street full of, of homes for these kiddies and, and more and more and more of these shacks are springing up all the time. We, we get phone calls every two weeks by somebody who said hey guys you've, you've got to help us out we went out we found this facility this woman is distraught there's more and more babies arriving all the time she's, she doesn't even know that she doesn't know and uh, and then we've got to get out there and start the process of helping them come on baby come on the kids come from a real variety of backgrounds the this is a place of safety, it's a designated place of safety, which means that if the kids are found late at night or that type of thing, the police can bring them in and we'll look after them. Otherwise, they come here through court orders, through the children's court. Um, and we have the social workers working both within here, so we have a residential social worker, and the external social workers work together to, to place the children here and to reunite them with families where appropriate. So the mission is always to reunite with an appropriate family member. And that can be, it's often an aunt or a grandmother. Um, unfortunately, the mothers and the fathers are often not around. Um, the children are here for a real variety of reasons, as I said. Um, it can be because of the mother being sick and can no longer care for them, or that the, you know, the father is out of a job and lives in a shack and is also not able to care. Sometimes it's neglect, sometimes it's abuse. Um, so they're all here for different reasons. <laughs> They're out of school now, so they're busy playing. The, the tragedy is for those that can't fend for themselves. As you know, we've got two million AIDS orphans. And uh, you know, what about, who's going to look after them? It's not just a question of feeding them, and it's not just a question of clothing them. It's a question of loving them. It's a question of integrating them into normal society. So there's just this massive uncontrolled experiment that's happening in our country right now where there's so many millions of people that are infected by this disease and so many millions more that are going to experience the consequences of the disease, i.e. The, the orphans. And who will they be when they're 14, 15 years of age? How well adjusted will they be? We don't know the answers to this, but we just have to do our best.
we've got indirect um, links uh, right now into 42 different organizations spread across the country. But um, we, we help many, many more that come to us for a variety of different things, whether it's financial planning or business planning or marketing or fundraising or um, organizational development. We've got a whole range of different products that we use to try to mobilize these NGOs. We're going in? Yep. Go in no problem. They, they won't bite. Won't bite me, eh? Yes. Hello, man. Mm, some of them are living with HIV and AIDS. Some of them are orphans, and some of them, um, they come from just for the day. Yes, just for the day. Hi, my name is Noma Wetun. We started to we started to to run this project from 2005. So we've got a year and a half now running this project. And what's the project called? Inkia Kiambo. Inkia Kiambo. Yes. <laughs> We started with 40 children, now we've got 60 children this year. 60 children? Yes, some of them are HIV, some of them have got TBS. Now we are still um, going outside for the, for, for the fans, asking for the fans in the streets. As we are working, we don't get salaries, so we are working free. So now we, are, we want um, um, a building and a salaries as well. All the projects that we, that we set up are geared towards being sustainable. We, we do our best to make them profitable as fast as what we possibly can, and then the profits we reinvest back into the space. Um, so it's really, it's a link between the donors and the charities, where in the past donors would just give money to the charity, and the charity would use it, and then go back to the donor and say we need more, and then that cycle would continue. But now we're slowly but surely persuading donors to instead invest into what we call social enterprises, businesses that make money for the NGO sector. Hello. Hello. We started um, collecting the children from the street because we, we, we as, as, as I am I'm the citizen of this place, uh, I, can, I did see the children were suffering because some of them, they are HIV, some the, 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 their parents hate them. So I started to see what's happening, then we started to do the project, collect the children from the, from the street and from the houses door to door. So the catch-22 is that you have these homes, whether you, the government likes it or not. As, as Norma Weta said, she saw the kids on the street. The, the, the HIV positive, the parents abandon them, they, there is, there's a stigma, then the parents die. So there are these homes and they do need to go for antiretroviral. So you've got this very rudimentary grassroots system of putting 40 children in a shack, walking them you know, miles to get a clinic every two days to get their antiretrovirals, and then coming back and then on the top of that having the system trying to put them down. But there's nowhere for those kids to go. There's just nowhere for them to go. And um, it's an almighty challenge. It's an almighty challenge. And it's not an isolated case. The word actually means progress. Um, and Bapomlele is this whole organization here, which started as a, a children's home and orphanage. Uh, but now this particular section is for adults who suffer with AIDS and TB. Okay, my name is Amanda. Hi nice Amanda. Hi. How are you feeling? Are you getting better? Yes, I'm getting better. Oh, I'm so glad. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling well. It's a, a stepping down facility, so people who've been into hospital and are almost ready to go home come here for about four to six weeks to um, get used to their medication. They're, they're all on uh, antiretroviral medication. Most of them are on TB medication, and so they're here so that they get regular medication, get used to taking the medication, good food, rest, uh, sometimes go home for the weekend, and then after four to six weeks they go home, hopefully stronger than they came and ready to get back to a normal life. I mean, that's the, that's the aim of the house. How long have you been here? Ah, I've been here, I can say it's almost a month now. A month? Um, yes. Okay. And do you live in Kalicha? 
Me, um, I'm staying in Milan, but at the moment I'm here in Kaili. Okay. And it's nice to be here. We eating healthy food, and we yeah, we we go wash with warm water. Sometimes we sit we sit outside. Some and when it's your appointment, you must go to the clinic. They, they take you to the clinic. There's transport here. Yeah? They take you to the clinic. If you are not feeling well, the sister and the nurses, they are here for you. Okay. And they are helpful. If you have a family problem, they are also there for you. If you don't have nothing, they are there for you. They're giving you clothes, some food, and they help you. So uh, this place is a good place. I like this place because it's help us a lot, you know. And we are learning a lot of things, you see. And we know when we go out here, we will, we'll, we will also teach the people there outside, see. I feel at home, yeah. I don't wanna, I don't say I'm in the hospital. I don't say I'm at home. Because we, we are all familiar. We are all familiar. And what about the poverty? Is that a big problem? Yes, yes, because again, we say they should eat healthily. You know, like Amanda said, you know, we eat healthily here. But when they go back home, you know, sometimes they go home to a shack. And it's very difficult if you're in a shack to cook, you know, cook proper food and to have fruit. And, and also, quite often, people don't have jobs to go back to, so they haven't got much money. So it's difficult then to, to get proper food. Sometimes I feel so helpless. Can't help myself. Like last week, I called my mother come and wash me because I can't wash myself. Were you feeling weak? Yes, really weak. I couldn't stand up. My baby wanted to be with me, I can't handle him. At that stage, they... That's very hard. Yeah. And did you, do you feel better this week? Yes, this week I'm much better. Is it up and down? Up and down. Yeah. So you definitely need good nutrition. It's a big priority. Do you think it's possible there may be other people that you know that have, that have the same condition but they don't say? I don't know. <laughs> So really, if you could have some wishes granted, what would you be asking for? This will be the life mm -hmm. for my children. That's my first priority. And how, in what ways better? I'm going to say, better future for them. For me, baby, I don't know how long I'm going to last, so, so I just want the best for them. Tula tu tula papa tula sana tuluma muzo buya ekuseni tula tu tula papa tula sana tuluma muzo buya ekuseni tula tu tula papa tula sana. It's a crazy thing to be a little bit. It's from all the ladies at the church. Hello. 
What is your name? Unesca. Unesca. Can I pray for you, Unesca? Mm -hmm. and Buddies was started about two years ago, and it was started by myself, um, basically just to, to meet some essential needs that I could see at the state hospitals. I used to, I'm a doula, and um, I did my training at many hospitals, some state and some private. A doula is a professional childbirth assistant, so we don't do anything medical, um, but we support moms during labor, and we just we rub their backs and put them in the bath and walk them up and down, and we just also help the birth partner because we don't replace the husband or the partner. We're just there to assist and to support and to just to, to make the birth experience positive. How was your labor? That's all right. Not too bad. Very oh, good. It's your first baby. Yes. At a private hospital, a birth is an amazing experience. And at a state hospital, it's just a really different, not so great experience. What's your baby? Just some nappies. Well, you use these nappies, eh? Private hospital, you get a, a maternity is like a diaper bag um, after you've had a baby and it's filled with all sorts of goodies. And, and I mean, most of the moms have got their own diaper bag full of their own goodies. At the state hospital, they don't get anything at all because from a marketing point of view, they're not viable. They're not going to be buying the product. So the companies are not going to give them anything. Um, and of course, this doesn't make sense at all. So we started making maternity bags and we used to go down once a week um, on a Thursday and give it to the moms. Toy for baby, would you play with something? <laughs> and there's some clothes for you. Would you like us to dress your baby? Some of them are, are very needy. They are literally walking with absolutely nothing. Um, and they'll walk out with just their baby, wrapped in a towel or a, a piece of sheet that the hospital gives them. So at least now they have a little outfit and a little hat and a baby grow and they're wrapped in a blanket. They've got a, a nappy on, they've got a few products, so just something to go home in. This is a, we bring extra preem packs for the very tiny babies. Look, I'll give this to this mom, look how small it is. Oh, it's cute though. <laughs> yeah, this will not fit Unesco's baby. <laughs> Let me give that to this other tiny little girl. Just the, the difference and just trying to equalize things a little bit. Um, and because I think birth is an amazing experience, it should be an amazing experience, and for so many of these moms it's not. You know, they're alone, they're afraid, the staff are overworked, they don't have the time or the patience to explain things or spend time with them, and so they go, they leave the hospital just feeling, just, it's like it's a negative experience. I want it to be positive, and even if we can't change their birth, we, they'll, they remember us as this lady who came and oohed and aahed over the baby and said, oh, your baby's gorgeous, and, and chatted to the mom and, and praying for babies and praying for moms and then giving them a gift. So when they leave the hospital, it's not all bad. They think, oh, you know, that's quite special. <coughs> We've started to employ two ladies to sew, and what we'll eventually do is when we get new premises, they will teach the moms to sew. So if any mom needs to learn a skill, they'll actually come to our little centre and learn how to sew, sew bags or sew whatever. So we just empower them a little bit further. I can see you're a good mom. Yes, darling, it's your first baby. And do you find uh, counselling is a big part of what you're doing? It's not yet, but we would like to get there, which is also why we need new premises. So we want a place basically where they can go um, and receive counselling, whether it be for postnatal depression or or just for the overwhelming feeling of motherhood and they can just talk and cry and laugh and, and just to, to have a voice to say it's all normal, you're doing a great job, you're a wonderful mom and to talk to other moms, you know, that in our culture it's such a common thing, in theirs it's really not and it's very isolating. So don't you want to upset your baby? <laughs> so it was your baby born and then an hour later started breathing? That is just oh, amazing. Yeah. It is absolutely fighter. amazing. He is a fighter, you know, and... Yeah, the doctors told me that he is going to be... Because there was so um, a lot of... Uh, oxygen. Oxygen yeah. going to his brain. He has serious brain damage. He won't be able to, to be like normal kids. 
go to school or to even do the normal stuff like we do dress ourselves and so yeah, like you know what God's a God who restores and we're not we're gonna we're not claiming that for his life at all we're gonna claim complete healing for him we're gonna pray for you for strength what is your name Candice Candice does he have a name oh yes I called him Regan Regan okay. yeah so it is it's a beautiful name Let's pray for you, Candice. Oh, Father God, I just lift up Candice to you, Lord, and baby Regan, Father God, and oh, Father God, she's had such a rough start to mother, Lord, and I just, I just pray for baby Regan. Sometimes they'll say to me, I'm HIV positive, will you pray for me? Um, but in terms of what we do, we don't discriminate between you get extra because you're HIV positive or you don't because you're not, your needs are greater or less. You know, they're just all moms with new babies. Yeah. So... When did you have, did you have cesarean? Yes. When did you have it? Yeah. This morning. Yeah. And he's also fine. Sure. Does he have a name yet? Yeah. What is your first baby? Yeah. How old are you? I'm 16. 16. So young mommy. Mm -hmm. Can I pray for you? What is your name? You really love your work, obviously. We love our work. We love our mothers. It's just we feel so privileged just to to share in their birth. I mean, babies are amazing. And the babies are so sweet. And when we often there, when a mom sees a baby for the very first time, you know, so to share in these things is just divine. And the ladies are just strong and brave and awesome women. They inspire us. They're amazing. You know, you're going to be a mother. The baby in your arms soon, soon. And your mom? Or she come afterwards? I don't know. I'm so don't know. Doesn't she know about the baby? Um, did I'm here now? Oh, okay. In the hospital. And are you able to phone her? My boyfriend has a phone. Okay. So he'll tell her. Mm -hmm. Does he know that you're here? Yes. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. He's outside. He's yeah, outside. Uh, shame. So he'll probably go home and come back. Mm. You must ask him when you're in the labour room if he can be with you there. Mm. Yeah. Will, he, will he want to be with you? Yes. Oh, he does want to. Mm. I'm glad he's with you. Mm. Eh? Is he excited? Yes, very excited. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad you've got his support. That's great. Good luck. I was a stockbroker in Johannesburg and um, I was very good at being a stockbroker. Um, I ended up owning my own asset management company, trading about 100 million rand a day, and I never really cared about anybody else on the planet but myself. And then uh, I found myself sitting opposite a specialist, and he told me at first that I had a terminal incurable disease called IgA nephropathy, which meant that the body cells in my body weren't holding on to protein, and um, as a result of that, it, my body was possibly cancerous, and after further tests, they found cancerous tumors in my bladder and in my prostate, and it had metastasized and was coming out of my skin. And um, my prognosis was very, very bad. And um, w when it first happened to me, I thought, how could this happen? I was young, I was successful, everything was going according to plan. And um, I was sick for a long time, and I was in a lot of physical pain. Uh, I got to a point where the physical pain was so great that I, I couldn't even tell where it was coming from in my body anymore. And, um, and then I, I'm not a religious person, but at my lowest, 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 lowest point, um, I really got to a point where I almost wanted to die. And um, I found myself praying to the universe. And I said, if there was anything that I could do to be spared what I was going through, then I would do it. And um, I had an epiphany. Uh, genuinely, like, uh, like a, a lightning bolt moment where I realized that I needed to change my geographic location and my career and my habits and my principles and my values and basically dedicate the rest of my life to serving humanity. And um, I got up and I immediately began making plans to do that and it took me a year to disinvest into all the things I was involved in. And that too proved to be a very painful experience. Um, my investors weren't sympathetic to my change of heart or to my uh, physical condition either. But um, we set our minds to doing it and, um, and we did it. We came down to Cape Town and uh, we wanted to make a difference. We didn't know where. And we started meeting the most amazing people. 
amazing people, all working for charity. And what we saw was their suffering. Their organizations lack funding, they're disorganized, and um, uh, as a result, their personal capacities, they also suffer. They get evicted and they've got no money. And it just seems to be that if you work for charity or if you work for an NGO, then it's not a real job. You know, there's still this strange thing that people look upon charity as being something that's separate to the rest of society. You know, the little old ladies with purple hair who shake tins and you give them money. But uh, really, charities are in the front lines of humanity. They are. Wherever you find an AIDS orphan or a street kid or an abused person or a sick person or a blind or disabled person, chances are you'll find an NGO um, coping or trying to cope at least with the problem. We were really lucky to have met Pisa and Heart of Healing at the beginning of last year and neither of us had done anything remotely close to what we did last year and the motto of the year was learning by doing. <laughs> of healing um, took us on and helped us to define who we were and what we were doing and helped us to register all the, the logistical side that we had no clue about to register to we've got a beautiful website now that they provided for us they, um, yeah it's been an incredible support beautiful smile on the face let's all take a deep breath in and breathe out there are three different components to the project, environment, health and life skills. And the focus is very much on practical tools and experiential education. So the environmental education, every school we set up an organic garden and we, there's a garden club which the facilitator teaches the kids about the garden and they do it together and the food from that goes into the school feeding scheme. Because many of the schools that we in have feeding schemes to feed as many of the kids in the school as possible. And then we set up recycling, um, the facilitator does it, and teach the children about the concept reduce, reuse, recycle and other environmental education. And then health and wellness, we teach the children about health and wellness and then also look at the school tuck shop and make sure that they're not just selling junk food and chocolates, that they're also selling fruit and healthy snacks. So for the children that want to start putting into practice what we're teaching them, that they are able to, because at the moment there's only um, chips and chocolates and cool drinks for sale. And then the foundation of what the facilitator actually does during school time is they run life skills lessons with the classes. So every class will have a one hour session per week with a facilitator where they'll do a bit of yoga and then a bit of these breathing exercises that you just saw, the bastrika um, and the sound meditation. And then we've developed a manual of life skills lessons. So in things like nonviolent communication, healthy body awareness, positive relationships, how to express emotions, um, the, the list can just keep on growing of what we can add to that. There's something, there's, there's a quality or a philosophy that Africans have called Ubuntu. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the principle. But um, Ubuntu is, is, it was the underlying philosophy uh, amongst black people for centuries and centuries and centuries. And it's only since the West, uh, they became westernized that the principle of Ubuntu has been forgotten. But the, it's based on your happiness is my happiness and, and principles, values of caring and nurturing and giving and consideration and respect and all of those things. And you find that in the grassroots areas, in the shacklands, you can find the most impoverished area. But the philosophy of Ubuntu is still very much alive. So I think that will be the one hope that we do have, is, is our ability as communities to stand together.
going into every cell in your body. the starfish principle now you know where the story where thousands of starfish washed up and the father said to the little girl why is she bothering to put the starfish back into the sea and she said because it makes a real difference to the one that goes back into the ocean and um, and that's what we're trying to cope with right now is to, is to just to eliminate the suffering not just on a on a physical level because Finding food and blankets and clothing is easy, but it's the emotional support, the mental support, the spiritual support. That's the, that's the real ticking time bomb, I think. You said one day, you will come back for me. And I will wait until you come back. Kobosha. 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 I love what I do. I, I love it. I absolutely, I, I, I love what I do and I can't work harder. Um, it is a never ending though and that can be exhausting. Um, it's difficult to go into um, an orphanage see 40 children um, being housed all day in a shack not much bigger than a caravan, um, n no food, and, and then to work really hard over a period of months to get them into a place which is reasonable. And as you've accomplished that, you've, there's another three more that come up. And that's a great challenge, you know, um, it's, a, it's a great challenge. What's happening in the communities a lot is that you find an established AIDS orphanage. It has a high profile. So all the funding goes to those organizations. And they've got money they don't know what to do with. They literally can't implement the funds that they have. But in and around those orphanages that are well established, there's lots and lots of just small household orphanages popping up all, of the sh all over the show that have got no funding. And they've got no access to funding. And they don't have any profile to access funds. And that's a problem, you know, that, that's the real problem is there's just, there's just so many people in this predicament. The, the people who are our clients are people who three, four years ago were domestic workers. They have no sense of, of business, of running an organization, but they see children running around on the street and they start feeding them. And before you know it, they have a small little AIDS orphanage with 10 or 15 people and then the moment the community knows that there's somebody caring for the AIDS orphan, all the mothers who are HIV positive go and assist, but they die. And then they leave their babies in that environment and, and that cycle just goes. We've seen AIDS orphanages 
in three years go from five or six children to 140 children. And, and even then, they, that's not, they're just you know, transition posts. They don't actually live in the, orf in the orphanage. They're there for three, four months, and then hopefully they get placed out into a home-based care environment. But the problem is massive. I, I don't even think the average South African realizes how, the extent of the problem. Uh, and we'll only experience it in five or six or seven years' time when the, the rising of, of street children um, gets more and more and more and, and crime increases, then, then we'll begin to experience it. I, I feel very hopeful. I, I, you know, not just for South Africa, it's a beautiful planet and life is genuinely an incredible miracle, as we all know, but humanity has got some very serious problems and it's not just a, an African problem. If you look at the global disease burden, if you look at global warming, if you look at poverty, if you look at unemployment, if you look at all of those things, there's, there just seems to be a separate, separativeness between those that have got and those that haven't got. And those that have got aren't really that concerned with those that haven't got. And that gap needs to be narrowed. But I, I think there's always been an equal and opposite, you know, there's as much good as what there is, there's bad. So uh, I am hopeful. <laughs> They say I'm a strong girl. Yes, yeah. I must be strong. Yeah. And you have to be strong for the lovely boy. I still want to see my son doing matric and going to university. Definitely. I want to see all that things. Yes. And I will if I just keep on believing. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs>